Last Sunday, we focused on our call to discipleship and the need to take time out of our everyday lives to focus on being present and listening for God's leading. Jonah's three days and nights in the belly of the whale provided him the opportunity to change his mind and respond to the call when it came a second time and the people were saved. We return to Jonah's story to focus on the power of one person's action to impact the world and God. Today's reading from Jonah begins with God choosing not to destroy Nineveh because the people of Nineveh repented. Then Jonah presents us with another twist in the story. Jonah becomes angry with God when God demonstrates grace in reversing the decision to to destroy Nineveh once they repented. Jonah feels sorry for himself. He preferred that God would take his life than to go on living in a world where his enemies were pardoned. As God raised the plant to give Jonah shade and then killed the plant and set the hot sun and wind upon him, Jonah expressed a greater care for the plant than the people of Nineveh. This care for the plant was felt even though, as God points out, Jonah had nothing to do with the plant's existence. Then the story ends with one of the more poignant questions in Scripture voiced by God. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who did not know their right hand from their left and also many animals? Throughout this fourth chapter, God engages Jonah with questions, not commands. God is the teacher to the unwilling Jonah as student. How does Jonah answer the last question? We don't know. How do you answer it? Within the question, there's an answer that I hear from the echoes of the words of the prophets particularly the prophet Jeremiah speaking for God. I am the Lord. I act with steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. God is concerned for Nineveh and all of God's children and all of creation. Jonah is written in such a way that it becomes easy for us to enter the story. Do we attempt at times to dodge our responsibilities as God's children, disciples of Jesus? Yes. Do we need time and silence away from the noise and busyness of our daily schedules in order to hear God's word for us? Yes. Are we surprised by the examples of God's grace appearing in unexpected ways at unexpected times? Yes. Do we get quarrelsome, disappointed, or angry with God when the results of something we are engaged in turn out different from what we anticipated? I think so, yes. And given that the word anger appears five times in the 11 verses of chapter 4, let's take a longer look at anger. Sporting events often provide examples of anger. When my grandson, Cody, was probably seven, I took him to his first football game. There was, from my perspective, at one point during the game, a flagrant interference call missed by the ref. I immediately jumped to my feet and proclaimed my disagreement. I don't recall my exact words. I hope they were at least PG-rated. When I sat down, I turned to Cody, and his eyes were wide. 
he looked at me and he said, Grandpa, you scared me. Why did you jump up like that? A silent oops went through my mind. And I went on to explain to him that there were times when Grandpa got carried away when I felt a missed call was made. Now, carried away is a euphemism for allowing anger to determine my actions rather than choosing my response to the situation sparking my anger. From then on, I moderated my exuberance a bit when Cody and I attended a football game. Another example. Imagine you were on the sidelines at a soccer game watching your daughter. An opposing team member comes up from behind, grabs your daughter at the neck and shoulder, and throws her to the ground. Suddenly, you find yourself on the field shouting at the ref, and you don't really remember walking out there. Overzealous parents or grandparents become quite the spectacle at sporting events when anger is in control of our actions. On the other hand, anger is the most useful, is most useful as a diagnostic tool. This observation is made by Eugene Peterson in his book, Under the Unpredictable Plant, an exploration in vocational holiness. Peterson continues, when anger erupts in us, it is a signal that something is wrong. Something isn't working right. There is evil or incompetence or stupidity lurking about. Anger is our sixth sense for sniffing out wrong in the neighborhood. Peterson offers the caution about the need to determine whether the cause of the anger is truly from a situation outside of us or it is due to our own issues, perhaps wrong information inadequate understanding, or an underdeveloped heart. Anger, resulting from situations outside of us, focuses our attention and energy on whatever led to our anger, such as abuse, hatred, or injustice. This can lead us to intervene to stop the abuse, to support those experiencing acts of hate, or to seek to change the causes of injustice. Gratefully, examples of su such compassionate and courageous acts are taking place throughout this country and the world. Although lately, it seems there is much in the news, so much in the news, that I am becoming exhausted from feeling such anger in response to headline after headline after headline mass shootings, terrorist attacks, parents or physicians or coaches or pastors abusing children, people in power, mostly men, harassing, intimidating, and sexually assaulting those with less power, mostly women, people, mostly white men, shouting words of hate and racism and taking hateful and racist acts to hurt or even kill people of color or people of the LGBTQ community. When we become worn down or saddened to the point of feeling helpless and hopeless, as Christians, we must turn to Christ Jesus, who came into the world so that all of God's children shall know God, from the least of them to the greatest. We have in the gospel passage from Mark, Jesus' first public act, to enter the synagogue and teach. As he taught, a man possessed by an unclean spirit confronts him. Jesus, possessed with the power of the spirit, presents a direct command to the unclean spirit. Be silent and come out of him. The people gathered in the synagogue have heard his teaching and then witnessed the miracles of Jesus freeing a man from possession by an unclean spirit. The people witness in Jesus' words and actions a new teaching with authority. 
it is so important for us to remember that we are not confronting the evil and hatred and cruelty in the world alone. We engage in this witness and struggle as a community, the body of Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, with Christ as our example. Each of us is called to embody God's love in our every word and action as each day's events come upon us. I close with two quotes of Mitzi Miners from her book, The Spirituality of Mark. May they be words of hope and promise for you this day. Where God's realm spreads, there is a marvelous breakthrough in the struggle against oppressive restrictions on human life. Through the transforming event of the miracle, people are freed from bondage and made whole. Jesus expects disciples to have faith that God's presence and power, along with whatever repentance is called forth, are for their good. Jesus expects his followers to believe that God's power comes packed in love and is unleashed on behalf of all of God's children.